So good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. For those who don't know me, I'm Sabine Schmidt, the permanent faculty at the School of Historical Studies representing Near Eastern Studies. And co-hosting today's webinar with me is Maria Mercedes Tuya, representing Digital Scholarship here at the IAS. We're glad that you can join us and hope that you're as excited as we are for having the opportunity to embark in a journey led by books and its owner. Different yet fascinating. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our two speakers who will present the joint project to digitally reconstruct a collection of books of one of the intellectuals of 19th century Ottoman Egypt. Adam Mestian is assistant professor at the history department of, at, in Duke University. His recent publications include Primordial History, Print Capitalism and Egyptology in 19th Century Cairo, um, uh, which was just published in, 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 in 21, and Arab Patriotism, The Ideology and Culture of Power in Late Ottoman Egypt, Princeton University Press, 2017. Katrin Schwarz is an assistant professor in the history department of the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and her articles in Middle Eastern book history have appeared in past and present, book history, history compass, and Ijmas, and she's currently writing her first book, Print and the People of Cairo. Adam and Katrin will speak for about 60 minutes. This will leave us for uh, with some 30 minutes for discussion in the end. Um, during the discussions and uh, during the presentations and also uh, later on during the uh, discussion, please type your questions and comments by using the chat function, addressing the panelists. And, and as I said, you can do this anytime. Please don't use the raise hand because there's nothing we can do about it um, given the limited time we have. And now without further ado, I pass the floor to Adam. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for this invitation. We are, we are very grateful for this opportunity. And it's so wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues coming today. And uh, we hope we will have a good discussion about this little project. I'm very grateful, of course, for, the, for, for hosting us. Thank you so much, uh, Sabine and, and Maria, and organizing this whole event. Um, so let me jump into this little project immediately. I, <clears throat> the structure of the presentation will be that I will introduce this, this little project in 10, 15 minutes maximum, giving a little bit of the social and political background of this project. Then um, Catherine will describe the data set itself and its place in Arab book history or Ottoman book history more in more general terms and more specific terms in a longer section. And finally, uh, we return actually together uh, talking more about the structure of the data uh, in TEI-XML and visualization. And Katrin will finish with a little trick in, <clears throat> in visualization. And then, of course, we, we are very happy to take uh, any question. Um, I almost said, I also want to say um, <clears throat> that, um, as you could see, uh, the topics will be wide ranging. So please do use the chat while we are talking to register your question because in the separate sections, we will talk about separate um, topics some, somehow. Um, all right. So this project is a, a project to create a so-called TI-XML marked up data set uh, in Arabic and in, you, in, in the Arabic uh, script and in, uh, in Latin transliteration uh, using the Library of Congress transliteration. The data set is a list of books from a 19th century Arabic probate inventory in Egypt. And we wish to create also a corresponding website with visualizations. This is a manually created born digital data set 
and I will talk more a little, a little bit uh, about uh, what, what manually created and born digital means. And of course, Catherine will, will also introduce in detail. Um, uh, this is an experimental side project for both of us. So whatever we will discuss today is just a moment uh, in, in the project. Um, um, this is not our main work. For, for instance, for me, this is this has nothing to do with my research at the moment. Um, so um, please keep, receive it as it is uh, as a work in progress. All right. The participants of this project are uh, Catherine Schwartz and myself. And actually, I started this project with uh, Sean Swanick, the Duke Librarian for Middle East and Islamic Studies. Um, um, three years ago, and very quickly I realized that, of course, we need a, a book historian, and anyway, the data is more useful for Catherine's research, so I invoke Catherine. We also collaborate with uh, Resk Nouri, my colleague in the Marcus Tarek Masr Misrel Muasir in Dar al Qutub in, in Cairo, and Hugh Kayles who is uh, the senior programming officer in Duke Libraries and the major master of TEI XML markup uh, language. And I will discuss that uh, more. We received a little funding for a little workshop two years ago uh, from the Duke Library and the Duke Middle East Studies Center and the Duke History Department. And UMass Amherst also helps us by providing a storage place for our data. So this project should be conceived or considered to be a kind of appendix to our um, book project. I mean, for my previous book project, which was which is just published by IFAO, and to Catherine's uh, new book project, Print and the People of Cairo. Um, this is like, let's say an online an online appendix to these books, but in itself, it also represents an individual project. Let me give you an overview about the process of the project. So it starts in uh, Dar al Wasa'iq in the Egyptian National Archives, where I, I will describe it in a moment. I, I, I was working with the files of an archival unit called Bayt al Mal or Bayt al Mal Misr. And one of the units um, contains, uh, one of the archival items contains um, this list. Uh, of these deceased uh, person's belongings uh, with books. The list of books, uh, then I trans, and of course I transcribe it in, in with handwriting and we collected the data in a Google Sheet document. We enriched the data in Google Sheet document and Catherine will describe in detail how. Then that Google Sheet is transformed into a table format in TIXML. Then I created a so-called XSLT code, which transforms the structure of that data into a new structural format. And, and meanwhile, we actually also created a staging website for, for displaying the data and the visualization. So this is the overview of the process. Um, the source, uh, or at least one, the major data source is the list of books in this probate inventory um, in, in, in the Egyptian National Archives, um, where I spent um, around 10 years, uh, 10 plus years to, to with, with my previous project. And uh, the archival unit is called Bayt al Mal or Bayt Mal al Misr or Bayt Mal al Misr. Um, and there is, um, so let me just give a couple of words about this archival unit <clears throat> because there is some something of a confusion often even among Mamlukists what is Bayt al-Mal exactly as a legal concept and as a bureaucratic unit. Now in, in 19th century Egypt Bayt al-Mal or Bayt al misr is the probate administration of the Egyptian Khedivate, the subordinated princely government uh, uh, in, in the Nile Valley. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it has nothing to do with the treasury. It is a, a fiscal unit. 
uh, and the legal unit, uh, which steps in when the wealth of the dead is without a legal persona, without an active legal persona, and administers the wealth of, sorry, um, uh, the, the wealth of, of problematic cases, so estates without heirs, minor heirs, um, elite who, who are deceased, but their property actually belongs to the Ottoman Sultan, or runaway slaves or missing persons, minors. So, so this is the function, the main function of this um, administrative unit. Um, I spent a couple of years with this unit as well. I'm now writing a series of studies about the fiscal administration of Egypt. And one study will come out uh, perhaps soon. I will be wrote it with uh, my colleague Resk Nouri, but specifically about the Baitan Mar. Mar. So those of you who are interested will have more details. Now, who is this person whose, whose books we, we discuss? Mustafa Salama and Nagari is with me since 2009 at least. Um, uh, I met him uh, when I did my doctoral research first. Um, he's a very interesting individual, so let me say a couple of, of words. He is someone we can call an Egyptian Ottoman small master of Muslim adab. Uh, if you, let's say, see the, if you read the work of uh, Dan Stoltz, um, you, you can see some of these small masters of, of Muslim adab who are not institutionalized in Al-Ashar or, or they are not jurists, not, not professional Muslim jurists, but they were trained in various Muslim sciences and, and, and knowledges, and they rather belong to the uh, households of rich pashas, in this case, to the household of uh, the, the Khedives of Egypt, of the governors of Egypt. This uh, person, uh, Mustafa Salama Nagari, uh, was educated by a poet who was perhaps originally from Anatolia, Said Ali al Darwish, uh, who was already uh, part of the Khedival household in the 1840s. And um, his main function was writing ceremonial uh, madih poetry uh, for, for the Khedives. Um, uh, his uh, protege, uh, Mustafa Salman Nag Nagari, also became close to the governors of Abbas Hilmi and Said Pasha in the mid 19th century. And we can see his social position uh, by his marriages. He, especially, especially one marriage, uh, he was married to Bizim Felek Hanum, who was a manumitted female slave, very likely, of course, of some type of Circassian origin um, of Burhan Pasha. So this, is, uh, this means that he was part of the clientage system of this mid 19th century Ottoman Egyptian elite. He was also very well connected to the very well known uh, Al Muwailihe family, this merchant uh, literary elite in mid 19th century, who was of course similarly part of the Khedival uh, network. Um, Nagari's career started uh, really going up when Khedib Ismail, Ismail Pasha, became the, head, became the governor of Egypt, the Wali of Egypt in 1863. Nagari was the, uh, became the editor of the Arabic edition of al al Misriya, the official government journal. Um, in various private, um, uh, printing presses, and he was also a founder of the so-called uh, Gamayat al Ma'arif, the Society for Education in 1868, and he was one of the investors in the printing machine of this society in 1869. So he was very, very active in the business, if, if we can uh, say so. If you are interested in the details, in my book, there, uh, there, there are much more details about, about him. Um, his works include uh, the poetical works, uh, usually manuscripts, three of them are in, in manuscripts. These are classic uh, poems, uh, entertaining stories, and so on and so forth. He also edited ceremonial praising poetry for Khedivi Ismail, 
1868, and he, he was an editor of at least four titles for the Gamayat al Ma'arif, this philanthropic slash capitalist enterprise to, to, uh, to produce new books uh, at, in Egypt at the time. Uh, now, this is my last slide before I switch to, to Catherine. Um, Anna Gary's estate um, uh, was uh, sequestered by the Bayt el Mal administration because uh, there were some fiscal problems. Um, for instance, he was owed money uh, there, uh, to, and, and uh, so therefore uh, until these um, financial dealings around the estate uh, were settled, the Beit al Mal um, uh, confiscated uh, the proper, all the properties. Um, now, he was a quite rich man by the time he died in 1870, just a few months after the opening of the Suez Canal. He had earlier three small endowments, uh, Aukaev, he also donated books actually to Al Ashar um, Library and especially, especially the Hanafi students in Al Ashar. So he, has, he had connections to Al Ashar. Um, he had two houses in Cairo. Uh, and of course, the inventory also contains uh, the furniture, clothes, cutlery, the female jewels, uh, jewelry, everything which was in the house uh, uh, and belonged to, to his estate. Now this list, this inventory list also contains around 450 printed and manuscript titles. We also know that some of them were borrowed. This means that we do not call this a library. We call it a list of books. We don't know, uh, as, as, as I just uh, explained, he was an investor in the book market so um, we don't know whether this everything belongs to his library, but it's certainly also in the inventory, it's just called Kutub. So that's the, that's the uh, title so, um, uh, of this list. Um, okay, um, so just the last sentence. So um, as you know very well, this project is in the context of several library projects. Uh, or, or books, book projects from Konrad Hirschler, recent uh, book by Ahmed, uh, um, Ahmed um, uh, uh, Shamsi and, and many others. Um, uh, we, we, are, we are very modest in our claims, I, I must say. And uh, Katrin will now uh, tell you in detail how this fits into this, this, this larger uh, story. So Katrin, I stop my screen sharing and please proceed. All right, uh, so thanks everyone in attendance here today. Thanks very much to our hosts, Sabine and Maria for having us. Um, as Adam said, I will speak about the overview of our project um, for about 25 minutes or so. And specifically, I want to dive into the book historical context surrounding Andagari's inventory, then talk a bit more about uh, the details of, of this inventory, specifically with regard to the books listed within it. I'm going to spend the bulk of my time discussing our projects, specifically our goal, how it is that we've been collecting the data that we're building our uh, data set around, some of the resources that we've been developing from this data, and I'll also highlight some of the, the many stumbling blocks that we've encountered along the way. And finally, I will uh, close before handing the floor back uh, to Adam once more by offering some visualizations that we're just beginning to create as answers to questions of uh, the data that we have amassed thus far. Uh, two uh, points that I wish to, to make uh, before we begin. One is that as you'll see, uh, the bulk of our research thus far has really concerned the uh, printed books within the collections for reasons that uh, will be apparent as I continue. And uh, secondly, um, in line with what Adam said, 
my comments are also rather wide ranging. Um, I have a lot on my slides. If there's anything in particular that you wish to call us back to in the q and A, I'm, I'm very happy to, to return to, to a given image. So let me begin by diving into um, some details with regard to the book historical context. 19th century Cairo is home uh, to the Ottoman Empire's earliest mainstream urban printing industry. The Ottoman governor of Egypt, Mehmed Ali, imported typographic printing from Europe to establish government presses in the 1820s, and notably establishing the press at Bulak, which was distinctive from the other presses uh, that he establishes because it is explicitly devoted to the art of printing rather than being subsumed within uh, other government departments. Importantly, from 1835, Mehmed Ali began allowing members of the public to commission books from this press at Bulak. That is, they could um, petition the, the government for a title they wished to print, to supply the government uh, with the manuscript to be printed, pay for the printing of this uh, text at Bulak, and, and then um, go off and, and sell the printings on uh, their own. Uh, this is significant, I contend, because um, it is what renders uh, the Kyrene experience of printing um, so distinctive and, and indeed uh, mainstream, open uh, to the public uh, for the first time, though uh, very much worth noting that, that this public is uh, literate, male, uh, wealthy, and obviously with um, some entree uh, to the government or at least interest in, in uh, engaging with it. From the 1850s, Mehmed Ali's successors began permitting private printers to found presses of their own, and these presses um, also worked on commission. They, uh, I should point out, uh, used lithography exclusively really until 1861, when many of them, uh, though not all, chose to upgrade to typography when they were given the opportunity to purchase off of the government some of its used typefaces. Uh, zooming out to the, the broader book historical context here, uh, it is important to keep in mind that then from the 1850s, government and private presses were operating at once, though uh, very much from uh, the bedrock of a manuscript culture, which was steadily being chipped away at um, and, and marginalized over the course of the 19th century. The inventory of Anagari's books is important because it is a snapshot of this transformation uh, from 1870. It is distinctive for containing manuscript and printed books both. And um, through this inventory, we can explore this transformation empirically for the first time, we believe. Um, if there are other studies that people are aware of, uh, digital or, or otherwise, that, that we ought to be alerted to, please do inform us. Uh, on the topic of the, the printings within this inventory in particular, they are well worth studying um, because, of course, they are uh, printed in Cunabula uh, of this uh, particular little uh, world here. And many of the details within these books are not captured by catalogs. They're not, uh, uh, they are not aggregated in, in any way or uh, systematically looked at. And, and so these uh, printings, which do really bear a lot of manuscript influence, um, for example, are uh, for the most part closed with colophons that end in triangular form formations and, and buried within them, you have a lot of crucial information that tends to, to be overlooked. Uh, for example, uh, you have with regard uh, to, to manuscript influence, uh, names of copyists, though in this case lithographic copyists, uh, names of chronogram writers and, and blurb writers, uh, but also new uh, features associated with the world of print, including the names of uh, commissioners, names of correctors, and even um, the very fluid press names of uh, the presses that we're publishing, uh, which could, uh, within one month, uh, offer multiple uh, titles uh, from one print to, to the next, because these names really weren't um, stabilized or, or fixed. Let me move now to talk about uh, the um, inventory of Anagadi's possessions. As Adam mentioned, um, 
the thing to note is that Amirari was a rich man. Uh, his inventory uh, reaching the, uh, the Beit al-Mal is valued by the court appraiser in March of 1870 at just over 50,000 piastres. Uh, for reference, uh, a European travel log, uh, or rather travel guide published at um, around the same time suggests that a dragoman working for a European uh, for a daily wage should be earning five to seven piastres. Uh, and so significantly here, of course, as Adam mentioned, uh, this is um, a, a collection of, of many things, including cutlery and, and two houses. Uh, but you see that the, the books um, within uh, his holdings are uh, over a third of the inventory's value. The uh, inventory lists in shorthand form uh, 444 uh, book titles. Uh, of these uh, book titles, 56% are uh, printed. So, so this slants, uh, this collection slants ever so slightly uh, towards uh, printing, though uh, printed books in fact make up nearly 70% of the inventory's book valuations. Um, this quirk um, is specifically because uh, Anagari happens uh, to die with in his possession nearly 800 copies of a printed book that he commissions. Um, and uh, these, um, this uh, printed book uh, in all of its copies is, is valued at 7,000 uh, piastres, which is where this uh, particular slant towards the, the printings is coming from. Uh, just to sort of take stock of, of this collection uh, relative to others, um, this is um, a large uh, collection relative to uh, Kyrene book collections at the time, Damascene uh, book collections at the time, but certainly not uh, large uh, compared to Princely collections. I won't get into the details here, but if, in the Q&A, people would like to, to learn a bit more about those. I'd be happy to, to speak to them. So what makes Nagadi's inventory important is precisely the fact that he's not a prince, um, that he is a subject. Um, and, and he is one uh, with standing as an intellectual, with, with wealth, um, one who serves as a government uh, functionary, and one who is active as a member of Cairo's world of print at that. So at one level, here is an exceptional guy, and N equals one. We're really diving into the, the collection of, of this one man. But at, at another level, um, he, he really is a sort of important star in the constellation of uh, what, what would be this, this world of print uh, during uh, this particularly important period. The inventory is also um, in, important and worth noting because uh, relative to uh, information that we have on other collections, this inventory does have a wealth of important details. Uh, what are they? So uh, separated out uh, from uh, manuscripts and, and printings as recorded by a uh, court appraiser, uh, we have um, the shorthand titles of uh, the books. Uh, with regard to the manuscripts, we have um, on occasion uh, brief descriptions of the, the physical nature of the work, like whether it is bound in leather, held in a case, both bound and held in a case, whether it is short, old, uh, Turkish, missing a section. Uh, and with regard to uh, the, the printings, uh, we, we have uh, this same um, information, uh, though, though notably for both, we have this useful um, estimated value in, in 1870. There are fewer uh, descriptions offered of uh, the, the printed books, but there are two points of detail that the court appraiser lists that prove to be enormously important for us. Um, first, how many volumes a, a given uh, shorthand uh, title spans. Sometimes this is helpful in tracking down the books, but, but of uh, really utmost uh, necessity is knowing whether or not, uh, as the court appraiser records, the text was printed by the government um, or as it says, externally. So you get the sense that this is indeed a, a government um, document. Uh, externally here means anything that is not the Egyptian government, uh, whether that be Kyrene private presses or whether that be any other press uh, the world over. 
So our goal then uh, is to identify the books in Anlagadi's collection and ideally to identify the precise version that he would have possessed, the precise edition or the precise copy. And we are doing this uh, to fulfill our outstanding uh, interest, as Adam had said, in his case, to, to learn more about the literary world of this figure who's been in his life for a few years, and in my case, to learn about the political economy of texts and the social network that he operated within. Uh, unfortunately for us, we have yet to uncover a manuscript or printing that he owned listed in the inventory um, itself. We um, have come across um, a, a, a manuscript, um, the uh, Staatsbibliothek, um, through the, the help of uh, Boris Librens, that um, has a, a, a stamp, uh, a seal for Amnagadi, um, uh, going by uh, Fatullah um, here. And uh, we also um, have, uh, thanks to that commissioned um, printing that he had so many, many, very many copies of in his uh, collection, as I alluded to um, uh, before, um, at, at the end of that, that uh, printing to sort of signal his, his contributions to its production, he, he went through and in each copy uh, stamped a different seal for, seal for himself, uh, Mustafa Salama and the Ghari. Uh, these seals uh, are not just eye candy here, I offer them as sort of wanted ads uh, to you if you haven't um, in, in, in the wild to uh, recognize these seals, please uh, let us know if you, if you find them, if you see his ownership um, inscriptions um, in, in, a, in a book. Um, but in any case, because of our goal of identifying the precise version that uh, Anlagadi would have um, possessed, we are limited in how much we can build out our manuscript data. Um, certainly in comparison to, as you'll see, what we, what we do with our uh, printed data. And, and so here, you know, in the Q&A, if people have ideas for us plausibly as, as to what we can do about this um, and, and sort of get, a, get away with, uh, we'd be very happy um, to, to take on suggestions. So let me talk a bit about how we set about this work. Um, in the first instance, we entered uh, the inventory's manuscript and uh, printed data onto two Google Sheets, uh, one uh, for, for each respectively. I have a small video here of the manuscript Google Sheets uh, where you can see it, it's merely a transcription of um, uh, essentially what would have appeared in the inventory and uh, we assigned to each entry for the manuscripts and for the printing respectively an ID number. Uh, from there, we are attempting to identify the full title of uh, the work for each shorthand title in the inventory. And in order to fulfill uh, this uh, task, we rely very heavily on online catalogs and uh, repositories, some of the most important of which I, I list here, but as everyone in this field uh, knows, you, you have to be sort of scrappy. So we certainly don't limit ourselves uh, to these. We, we try and search every corner of uh, the, the internet. And we also lean a lot on um, other uh, digitization projects, which are uh, constantly um, cropping up or, or being brought to our attention. Now, as um, I mentioned, um, we can do more with the printings. And um, in particular, we can establish with some degree of certainty the addition that Anagari was likely to have uh, possessed. And we can do this um, by um, essentially um, searching for, for titles, but using um, the death date of 1870 as a cutoff with the understanding that in 1873, you know, a, a published book uh, obviously would not be falling within this inventory. And also using this crucial guidance about whether or not um, what uh, we are seeing um, is governmental or external. Sometimes uh, only one book was printed that fits all of the parameters. And in this case, we are absolutely certain that we are identifying the book. Other times uh, we discover actually that there are multiple editions of a work, multiple editions of governmental uh, printed book or of external uh, press printed books. And so in this case, we're only relatively certain that we are identifying the edition that he would have had a copy of. 
So here we follow uh, some rules of, of thumb. Uh, for example, works uh, closer to um, 1870 than, than uh, older ones are privileged off of the suspicion that he would be more likely to, to own uh, books closer to the date of of uh, the inventories uh, drafting. We also uh, privilege uh, works made in Cairo over ones made from afar in cases where we have publications from multiple cities. And we uh, 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 privilege works that bear, of course, Amnagadi's name rather than ones that don't in cases where, for example, he serves as a, a, chron a chronogram writer within uh, the text. And so from there, um, once we've identified from the shorthand uh, the uh, uh, titles uh, 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 that, of the uh, books that we are after, we then um, search for, for these um, printings and we attempt um, uh, to either consult them in, in person or ideally digitally and um, uh, where uh, digitally to collect digitizations of them to hand gather more data. And uh, let me pause here for a second, because as Adam said, this is really what makes our project um, distinctive. Though we are working with um, uh, both manuscript and printings, when it comes to the, the, the printings in, in particular, we're not um, just using OCR, optical character recognition. We're really diving in and, and hand gathering this um, uh, information. It is um, uh, enormously laborious. I think it, each of us has probably put an hour at the end of the working day for the past three years into this task. Um, and it's really only from um, this effort that we're beginning to be able to, to play um, with data that is becoming more meaningful. But uh, to just show you what this looks like, um, here's an example uh, from the printed uh, books. You can see that we've um, assigned this 108th um, a, a book and, and an ID number in the printed Google Sheets, though the inventory itself only um, refers to this as um, Diwan uh, Shab al uh, valued at two uh, piastres and, and printed externally. So we track this text down, and once we have it, we go through it by hand to find um, its, its title, um, its author. In, in this case, the, the title is, is longer with Telemsani's full name. We keep tabs on um, where the pagination begins. We note whether this is a lithography. Uh, we search to see whether it has any seals, uh, contemporary seals or, or ownership inscriptions. At the end here, you'll see that the, the text itself has a colophon um, denoting the, the finishing of its writing, but then also um, a printed colophon to, to sort of reflect the conclusion of the printing. We have the paginated page, the name of the copyist, the name of the press, Matmata uh, al-Hajar, but crucially also the press owner, Musa Castelli, press's location, the month and the year of the publication, the chronogram and uh, writer's uh, name and, and the uh, corrector's uh, name, the, the date of this. And when you compare this information here um, that we're ultimately gathering to you know, what you would have in, in this case from uh, the, the catalog of, of the British Library, you can see uh, that we really do have so much more um, in addition to just the name of the author, the title of the, the work, uh, the fact that it's printed at Matbat al-Hajar, but not uh, the, the, the press of whom, uh, Castelli, and, and uh, the year. So uh, from this, uh, we ultimately um, hand gather all of this uh, data from the absolutely and relatively certain works. Thus far, we've um, both identified um, and been able to consult 143 of Anagari's uh, 251 printed books. There are others that we have yet um, uh, to consult, even though we've identified them. And um, ultimately, uh, we are compiling uh, this extra data around roughly 50 bibliographic and extra bibliographic uh, categories. And you can see uh, the small video here of our printed Google Sheet, um, which compared to what you've just seen of, of the manuscript uh, Google Sheet is, is much more extensive. Um, and in the left-hand corner, I, I list some of the uh, categories that we are uh, collecting texts from. Okay, so in terms of the digital resources that we are building um, from uh, this effort, uh, firstly, uh, we have uh, been uh, creating a um, blog, the, the link is, is up there. Um, and here we've been reporting on our progress 
um, as, as we've been moving along. We also have a, a reflections um, page where we are um, constantly reflecting upon the uh, decisions that we're taking, the, the choices that we're making. The reason that we did this is because as we were looking to other projects for inspiration, um, we, we often found that there wasn't a place where um, uh, contributors were uh, self-consciously reflecting upon their, their progress as they were moving along. And we figured that um, with other uh, projects of uh, a similar um, variety that will be coming about, that this would be a helpful thing. Uh, for, for others to sort of keep tabs on, on us and, and perhaps also inform their choices. Um, Adam will, in a few moments, um, talk again um, about uh, these, these next two resources that uh, we are in the process of creating, the TEI XML database from the Google Sheets uh, data and ultimately a, a website um, to publish our, our data from the TEI XML uh, database. So in terms of uh, stumbling blocks that we have encountered, um, there have been many um, of a variety of, of, of forms. Um, access is certainly one, unlike Adam, for I've spent the past 12 years being rejected um, from Donna Lutha Ik um, and, and from uh, the Egyptian archives. So certainly one of the issues here has been uh, working at a remove um, from the inventory, having to lean on Adam's notes, having to, to lean on um, uh, colleagues' edits in the case of people who are able to, to go in and, and cross-check against the inventory on our behalves. Um, also, um, with regard to data collection, you, you've uh, uh, sort of seen an, an easy example of data collection, but really we end up having to make uh, decisions about entries on a case-by-case uh, case basis and to document our choices. Uh, we also have discovered very much an uneven playing field for researching manuscripts and uh, printings to uh, the same extent for a variety of reasons. We've encountered um, stumbling blocks with regard to publish, uh, plugging into the scholarly landscape, identifying our own target audience, um, uh, finding ways in which um, our project can be informed by the very many different types of, of projects that are already out there. And of course, also securing funding for um, what is a modest digital project, though, though certainly uh, we, we believe in an, an important um, one. Uh, without this uh, funding, which we have yet to secure, um, we uh, have really been having to develop um, our own technical skills at, at every turn to, to lean very much on generous colleagues who are willing to share their expertise on, on a variety of different issues with us. Um, so let me uh, come to a uh, close now by uh, just uh, sharing with you some of the visualizations uh, that we've been um, creating uh, in order to answer questions that we're asking of uh, the data. Uh, so we know just from the inventories themselves uh, that uh, uh, the most expensive uh, printed books um, in uh, Nagari's uh, collection uh, were indeed more valuable than the most expensive manuscripts and that, um, uh, however, uh, print and uh, manuscripts were, were on average more or less the, the same price. Um, but now uh, we can begin to ask concerning uh, the printed books, uh, for example, uh, what was it that determined their, their value using um, this data that we've been gathering? Um, surprising absolutely no one. Uh, we see here that, that longer books cost more, um, but, but we can see some more interesting things as well. Um, for example, there doesn't appear to be an antiquarian um, price bump in book valuations, which is to say that the court appraiser does not uh, take a book from the 1820s or, or 1830s and, and, and render it more expensive um, simply because it's older. Uh, in line with uh, the contemporary sources uh, from Cairo, we do see uh, here as well that uh, government uh, printings were um, more expensive on average than uh, external press uh, printings. And, and in fact, we can now say just about doubly so. Uh, with regard to the external um, presses themselves to, to tuck into them, uh, we can also see, um, and this surprised me, that um, in fact, lithographs are more expensive than uh, typography. 
Um, but but what is what was happening here is that uh, lithographs tended to be shorter than uh, typographies. So so though they are more expensive um, per page, they were um, uh, ultimately um, uh, cheaper. And um, perhaps because of this, um, we we can also see when we um, uh, graph uh, the the appearance of um, lithographs uh, that 1861, when the government does sell off its typefaces, really really does seem to be um, a breaking point, even in um, and Nagati's own uh, collection of uh, the appearance of lithographs. We can also begin to ask using mapping uh, where uh, these texts came from. Uh, here uh, we uh, can see that um, overwhelmingly they uh, came from, from Cairo in the case of Anagari's uh, collection. Um, and, and importantly, actually um, very few coming from Istanbul, the fourth most manifested uh, city here, uh, uh, preceded by Beirut and, and Tunis. We can also begin to see where in Cairo um, uh, presses uh, were clustered around in the in the events where we have um, details um, regarding their their address or or their location. And so you can see Bulak uh, appear in red and another government press in, in green. But effectively, that the external presses are located uh, just beyond the the, the market Hana Khalili um, and and Azhar here. Uh, lastly, uh, we're using networking uh, technology to look at who is uh, making these uh, making uh, these texts and also what their business networks are. So uh, we can see uh, here uh, through uh, this network uh, graphic that there are very many more commissioners, for example, than there are uh, lithographic copyists and only a handful of, of people who, who might have served as a corrector and also a commissioner. And uh, finally, with, with regard to um, sort of networks of uh, presses and people, we can begin to see interlinking uh, dependencies here. So uh, in, the, in the case uh, of, for example, um, Mustafa Wahfi, who was uh, the head Turkish uh, Tran, uh, sorry, the head Turkish corrector for uh, Bulak. Um, we can see that um, after his father-in-law uh, dies and leaves him a house, he establishes the Wahbiya Press in this space, and he takes commissions um, from it uh, uh, by um, people, but also the the group that Anagadi co-founds, the Gamiyat Al Maarif, until it, in its turn, um, also establishes its own. Um, press, but we can begin to use this this networking uh, data to, to also fill in gaps in cases where, for example, we know a name, but we don't know uh, which uh, press uh, you know um, uh, was associated uh, with that name, and, and we can begin to identify uh, this with not certainty, but some degree of confidence. And with that, I give the floor back to Adam. Hi, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Catherine. Okay, so let me just give a couple of um, a couple of um, technological or practical details about the data set. Um, how we how how we do this? Uh, so we we create uh, uh, this data set in a so-called TEI uh, XML format. Uh, which is a markup language. Uh, its main purpose is to make a text or actually any kind of data machine readable. That is the computer can understand any piece of text. This is a very useful uh, means to, to play with the data uh, with any type of programming language, uh, because you can transform this format into any type of programming language. Now, my own teachers are Til Gralert, who is the master of TEI XML in Arabic. And I want to uh, call your attention to his uh, project in uh, early Arabic newspapers. 
He is really the, the pioneer here. Uh, of course, our common project previously, Project Jaraid. My other mentor is Hugh Kalas, uh, who is a Duke Library uh, uh, programmer. And as I said, he's, um, he's a major TEI XML figure. He uh, the famous Greek papyri project at Duke, uh, which used this format, and until today, Hugh is the TEI, a main TEI uh, person. Of course, I also learned a lot from Eric Monson, who is the visualization advisor at Duke. All right, so the project segments, uh, Katrin described the uh, data collection and, and, and some of the intellectual results of, or questions we can pose to the data, but how do we, how do we deal with this data? Uh, so after the Google Sheet, we transform it into TIXML. Then there is a data enhancement. This is the this is the phase right now. We are here when we we start to correct our data again and again. Of course, we already corrected the data at least three times fully uh, manually uh, in the last two years, and we also started to build an HTML website hosted by GitHub, which is of course uh, really just a staging website, but we started to think about how to organize our data uh, for free access as well on the internet. And of course, we will also publish it in Zenodo. So I saw that Till already asked whether he can, he can have access to this data. Yes, of course, uh, um, uh, either when we finish it or if you want, you can just join us. Uh, some quick words about the TIXML format. So I really think that this is a very good tool for especially philologists, microhistorians, um, um, historians or, who, or literary scholars who want to deal with something qualitative, small qualitative projects, and they don't have uh, a big team or funding or, 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 or availability. And, 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 and they want just to do, deal with something small, precise, and go into very, very detailed ways to, 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 to play with the data or online publication. So the usual use of TIXML is for online publication of texts. It, had, uh, it has a number of uh, interesting problems and also solutions, especially to Arabic uh, texts. Uh, we can discuss it later. Uh, we, you can use this it, into anything. For instance, here I have a little project on Patawa, uh, or with Professor Mercedes Wolle, we have a project on um, uh, urban news from Al Waqai or Mesreya. And of course, uh, we also have this project Jeraid, which is a different type of project, but it is also in TIXML, and now it's also uh, in Arabic and, and in, in Latin script. And of course, if you, if you, if you create a machine readable uh, text or data, then every single text becomes a database. So for instance, here you can see the visualization of Arabic periodicals around the globe uh, from the 19th century until 1929 uh, in, in time. Um, so so the TIXML is, is, I think, is a good tool. I myself recently learning it um, from these masters of mine. And uh, I, I, I really enjoy it, I must say. It's, uh, there is some drug, drug effect in it as well. So in this particular project, the TIXML phase looks in the following, in a detailed way. So we have the Google Sheet, then we download the Google Sheet as an Excel file. Then in the OxyGarage, uh, very easy software, uh, we transform it in automatically in two minutes into a TIXML file in a table format. So the structure of the data remains a table. Then we edit it. Then I uh, write, uh, write now an XSLT transformation code. And the final file will be again a TIXML file, but in a different structure. The data will be in a so-called Bible structure format. Now, I just want to show a, a, and share my screen um, for one particular little problem before I give the word back to Catherine. Uh, 
Now this, this. Uh, because that, pro so this is how the transformed uh, and already a little bit corrected uh, Google sheet looks like in, uh, in TIXML format. You can see that it is still a table row cell structure. And then the data is organized. So this is the first row. And then the data is organized in, in this way in Arabic and in transliteration. Um, now, as, uh, as, as, as Catherine emphasized, what we have here is actually some type of a pseudo data chain because we have two sources of data. One is the inventory file, the, inter the daftar, the inventory book. And the second source of data is actually the scan of a given, doc of a given book that we located or a physical copy of that book that we located. So the uh, data chain, which is related to every single ID in this list of books is something of a pseudo, pseudo title. So it, it, it has all kinds of interesting questions about representation and ontology, but I don't go there. The technical problem is that how can you transform this data into another structure and Meanwhile, you automatically indicate the two data source. That is, which, which data is from which data source. It's very important to preserve the original data source, not to confuse or actually not to create a real fake, a fake title. So uh, the solution is that I, I discussed with, um, with you is the following, and I want to give this specifically to those of you who are interested in digital humanities, so the digital part of digital humanities, is this standoff, um, uh, um, this standoff um, element in the file, which is simply a source description. One uh, is, a, is uh, describes the daftar with the simple ID of D, and then there is a note that the other source of data is, is the given title in a collection. This is the problem how to indicate that one, one source of data is always there, so it's the daftar, but the other source of data is always changing because we have a different scan every time rendered to every single title. Now I wrote this, uh, uh, this XSLT transformation that I, learning and myself also. And here the solution is very simple, namely that the, uh, the um, scan receives its own XML ID, which is actually a variable defined separately here, which automatically, when I transform the table into the bib structure, uh, this transformation automatically generates an ID for every single scan and automate for every single uh, um, um, data chain. Uh, and that uh, ID can go into a source, a source attribute to every single, um, every single data piece of data here. And meanwhile, I just automatize the other source uh, and keep it stable that it will be always the daftar. So in this way, when, I, when finally we will transform the, um, uh, the original table structure into a, 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 a library conform data, then uh, then every single piece, little piece of data will have automatically its own uh, indication about, uh, about the source. So this is a nice little trick, I think. And um, there are many other, um, of course, technical questions here, but I don't want to rob our time and I will just give the floor to Catherine back to, perhaps you can say something about visualization and then we just stop. Sure thing. So, um, yeah, with regard to the, the visualizations, 
basically it, it's come um, down to thinking about what it is that we would like to see, what questions we have and, and what our data can possibly provide us by way of answering. And, and then um, from there, uh, figuring out what resources exist in order to make those visualizations come to life. So um, thus far, it's been a matter of um, taking the, the uh, Google Sheets uh, data, um, converting it into either XML or CSV files as required. And um, thus far, um, plugging it into uh, four programs. Uh, so the, the visualizations that uh, you've seen today from, from my slides come either from uh, very basic Microsoft Excel for pie charts and graphs, Stata with regard to statistical modeling. And, and this is a bit more difficult because you need to know a bit about statistics, but also um, uh, entering the, the data as required by the, the language of Stata. Uh, Tableau, which is a really excellent and quite advanced tool uh, for mapping and also for creating uh, in, in network uh, maps among uh, many other uh, things. But what I wanted to, to call people's attention uh, to, particularly the, the Luddites um, among us, is that um, Stanford has a uh, Palladio um, a project. It's actually um, built around uh, a project uh, that it hosted um, on, uh, concerning the um, Republic of Letters out of uh, Europe where people uh, charted uh, the movement of correspondence. And very generously, the people involved in this project actually boiled down the um, network uh, mapping tools that they uh, created. And so if you uh, go to uh, Stanford's Palladio project, as you see in this uh, visual here, and play with the website a bit because it can be sometimes buggy, but essentially uh, load up um, your, your data as it is um, asked for, uh, really just in this case, sort of setting your specifications, giving um, a, a number uh, to each of the entries, you can then go ahead and uh, graph uh, very easily network data. And so this was the source that you saw for uh, the visualizations that I ended with. And uh, I wanted to, to show this in particular because uh, what you saw um, were screenshots, but really this is a dynamic data that, that can um, move around. And uh, so I will stop there. Well, thank you both very much for this uh, fantastic uh, presentation. Um, we already have many questions and uh, I hope we can address as many as possible. So please bear with us if we can't do everything. Um, so I'm starting with Amina El-Bendari, El -Bendari, who has two questions. The first uh, you kind of already answered before because she asks, whether you were able to trace any of the particular manuscripts in current collections back to him. And uh, she has another question. Um, can you tell us something about the titles and topics represented? This is actually also a question that also Devin Stewart had. Does the collection or list reflect the, generally pop the general popularity of the time or is it skewed in a different angle? And what's the title um, that he invested in the 800 copies? Adam, I don't know if you want to weigh in on this on, on account of having sort of written about his intellectual life uh, concerning the, the work he translated. Um, sorry, so, but there were several questions about the, so which question we should take first, I, I think. Well, I, I think let's, let, we can speak, uh, you can take it from the top if you wish, but uh, effectively um, just discussing um, what, what, what we see in this collection with regard to his intellectual interests, which do come across very strongly. Yes, so um, so he is a literary person, as I said, he is not a jurist. Uh, the, the bulk of his collection is are, are literary works uh, and history, of course. I mean, tarikh, uh, so whatever tarikh means. Um, and um, uh, and and the, he does have he he does have some uh, Potawa collections, especially in Hanafi law, um, 
but um, his his main interest seems to be uh, in in this really this literary um, underworld. Um, and, and what what else can I say? <laughs> um, the he, he was um, so the, the the his manuscript that I translated is um, is is something of a, of a strange world history of Egypt from the creation to the rule of uh, uh, Ismail Pasha. And um, he is also very interested, I was interested in this because he devises a new primordial history. So what happened before, before the flood uh, in biblical times. So he devises a whole new idea because he has a quarrel with, uh, with, Egyptian, uh, Egypt, with, with uh, European Egyptologists. And it's uh, really great. And um, so, so he's interested also in this Muslim legends uh, about, about Egypt's own history. Um, and so this, that is, this is his literary world and his uh, collection um, reflects this. One final note, yes. So he's a master of tarikh in the sense also of chronographs. So he is a master chronogram writer He's super interested in this tempo, in this relationship between time and text. So representing time through poetry. I, I presume everybody knows, um, everybody knows uh, poetry. Uh, sorry, everybody knows what tarikh is or what chronogram is, but so this is the, the, the device when, when you, and there, so every letter have a, a numerical value, so you can write a sentence uh, or a word, and it expresses uh, a number, and it's usually a number of a year. So uh, he was a master of, of these chronograms. Uh, Mercedes Wolle, my colleague, also alerted me that actually he wrote a chronogram for one of the objects sent to the Paris exhibition in 1867. Um, so there is, there is actually a cupboard with with a Nagari uh, uh, chronogram also, so he was in his library reflects this fascination with time as well. Um, sorry. And, and I just I just wanted to add because I think it's really interesting. Actually, like the most valuable manuscript that he has, valued at three hundred fifty piasters, is an ornamented six volume copy of Al Jabarti's uh, chronicle. Um, but uh, he he also has. Um, uh, he reflects his interest in, in a manuscript in print, sometimes through the, the same um, works, the same uh, diwans of, of poetry, like uh, Diwan Ibn Ma'atuk. Um, and uh, he, he has copies of the Matan Althea uh, in, in Al Althea in, in both. Um, and, and interestingly, there we see that the prices aren't very um, far, far ap apart um, in, these, in these cases. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on this, because we have a couple of questions that go into the direction that people really want to know what, what is actually content wise in the inventory. So Devin Stewart, uh, uh, he, he adds that, oops. Um, yeah, this is, sorry, this, is, this is me. Okay, if, if you open this thing, the chat goes away. So <laughs> for me at least. So uh, you didn't mention any titles. So uh, are literary works or poetry, Abbasid poets, rich histories, Mamlo chronicles, and another related question from Ahmad Khan is, um, are all the works in the inventory Arabic works? And uh, do, do we have any Persian or Turkish titles uh, this period alongside Arabic? So the language distribution is, is another question that came out uh, in this, uh, was mentioned in this context. Yeah, sorry, I just, excuse me, I just shared my screen and I will put this in the chat. So in our staging website, we, 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 we display all the titles. So feel okay. free to explore it. Uh, uh, there is a separate page with, we haven't, we haven't worked uh, on the manuscripts, but we also put it online uh, in the way I transcribed first. We, we have, uh, from, from my colleague Risk, we have uh, corrections to this list, but we just put it online. So uh, let me put this in the chat to those of you who, who, who want to indulge into the, into the um, uh, please visit the site and explore um, the, the details uh, of, of all the 400 titles. Um, 
uh, as to the Turkish titles, Catherine, do you want to? Well, I, I, I wanted to say that um, with regard to um, periodization, there are um, things um, from uh, largely the, um, let's say the, the 16th, 17th century, but also there's a lot um, out of, out of uh, contemporary Cairo, Cairo in his, his lifetime. So uh, for example, the um, Divan of Al Darwish that he commissions is, is that of his uh, teacher. Um, and and we see very many sort of contemporary um, in influences and and interests there. Um, uh, books Adam suspects from um, Marriott Bay and uh, also uh, Tahtawi. Uh, with regard to the the language question, uh, for the printings, I'd say we've found. Um, uh, maybe around uh, 10 or so, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Adam, that are uh, definitely uh, in Turkish. There are others where we're not entirely sure, you know, um, is that an Arabic title or a Turkish title? Interestingly for the manuscripts though, uh, only one has a comment written by the court appraiser that says Turki. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's um, actually a, a, a mashaf. Um, Islamuli, uh, it, it says. So uh, the, this does seem to be a predominantly Arabic collection. Okay. Um, there are, uh, I mean, going to, to more technical stuff, there are two questions from Til Gralat, one of which you already answered. Uh, do you plan to share the bibliographical data on an open machine uh, actionable form and allow me to dream as linked open data, probably by leveraging uh, um, uh, Wikidata? And he has another question. Are you trying to auto-match titles against Zeriklis Al-Alam or Yusuf Zalki's Modern Matbuat, both of which are available in full text, though not modeled from Shamila? It seems that Biblioteca Arabica in Leipzig are working on transforming both works into uh, a graph database, which would help with such an approach. The answer is yes to both questions. <laughs> okay, good. Um, um, maybe a content question uh, in between. Uh, Ulrike Freitag asks, do you see any commissioners from outside of Cairo? A good, good question. Um, not, not really for the most part. It does seem to be a very um, Kyrene um, uh, project. Um, you, you get uh, sometimes the name of, of figures um, in in Beirut um, or uh, references in the in the case of the. Um, the Tunis printings of uh, a printing coming about of the initiative of so and so, the 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 order, the the command of a so and so, um, but but this does seem um, to be um, a practice at least within this collection that that I I see as as being very much uh, Kyrene centric. I don't know, Adam, if you have a different view. It's a Cairo collection. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, three questions from Will Henley. I'd love to hear about the general characteristics of the works that you cannot identify. Also, what have you been able to understand about the court appraiser, the person, his job, his expertise, the quality of his work, et cetera, et cetera? Um, Another question by Will, a skeptical question about someone who is a TIA XML believer. What is the added value of using, of using TIA XML for an inventory that is essentially a list, i.e. a spreadsheet? And he uh, specified um, more specifically, what is the added value of using, of using TIA XML to encode a structured list rather than using a spreadsheet? I can I can take the the first um, one uh, that that will raises hello um, that uh, one of the one of the things that um, this uh, that we've been struggling to detect through uh, this this inventory are actually what what ends up being uh, the very cheapest of the the printings so um, things that are valued at one piaster or or two piasters with with some regularity are actually not showing up um, in our searches. Um, 
uh, with uh, the same uh, frequency on, um, let's say, WorldCat or, or HathiTrust scams as uh, the the sort of um, bigger um, books there. So that's that's been sort of interesting. Adam, I don't know if you want to address some of the other questions. Um, yes. Um, well, just a footnote to 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 this to this answer. So yeah, we, there are also other titles that that simply there are too many editions. So we just decided not to um, uh, not, not to not to identify through for one so because just we don't know which which one was used. Um, um, the, it, it appears that the Arabic printed book market was 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 quite large already by 1870. So um, there were several there are several titles which have three, four, five editions already by that time. Um, so it's it's very interesting. Uh, also, of course, editions in Europe, editions in, in Egypt or in India, right, or in Beirut. So yes, yeah, so. Um, the the skepticism yes um obviously if 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 you if you just want to do some simple cvs or X, i mean softwares which just you you want to uh, you need only a simple uh, data set then you there is no need uh, for tei xml transformation but if you want to um, indicate, uh, as, I, as, as I just showed, um, uh, in a very detailed level of sources, if you, have, if you want to play with the data, I think it's very useful to, to, have, um, to have the TI XML format. And honestly, for, for myself, actually, this is simply an experiment to learn. Um, um, this is the first time, for instance, that I write an XSL, a proper XSLT, a transformation. So I, for for myself, this is uh, just to learn, um, and 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 I try to somehow involve uh, Catherine and actually others also to to in the TI XMR world. So this this is um, this is also the meaning of it to use to to teach people. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Khalid Fahmi. The first one is also about the contents, which you already um, discussed. And he has another related question. How does your project compare to that of uh, Nelly Hannas in Praise of Books, where she followed a similar path using, using probate records to reconstruct the private library, but for the purpose of studying what people read and hopefully what they believed? Yeah, I, I would say here we're, we're taking a totally different um, per perspective, mainly on the, the production side of things. We're trying to, to, to see um, uh, through this sort of world of, of books, particularly the, the printed side, who, who would have been involved in, in making this. And I, I don't, um, many of the um, commissioners, for example, are, or the correctors, some of the more important ones are, are names who are already sort of familiar to us. And there you can actually get a, a bit about their, their interests by looking at the various titles um, or specialties that they involve themselves in. But for, for many of them, we're picking up names um, for, for the first uh, time. And, and so that um, it doesn't really give you very um, much uh, to, to go by. Um, then with regard to the other level of um, Anmagadi himself, it's hard to say because we don't, uh, quite know what to make of this uh, collection relative um, to to him. Um, it, it clearly bears his intellectual imprint and obviously his his business interests um, with, with regard to the uh, commission uh, book that, that uh, book that he has so very many copies of. But it, it's harder to um, it, it's harder to sort of say more about what he um, believes just looking at the the inventory itself. Well, I, I have a footnote here. So, uh, of course, readership is, is be very hard to know. But actually reading the, the works of Nagari, one can see what he reads, what he built on. So that is actually, so read, so Nagari's reading shouldn't be based on his collection, but on the works that he is producing. And that is a very different approach. And those who are interested in should 
have a look in my little book because I, I have some notes on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have another question from Mele Liklema. Um, thank you for an interesting lecture. I've been trying to trace the development of a specific genre through studying library catalogs. In this context, I've been wondering about the 1872 catalog mentioned in your blog. Can you say a bit more about this catalog and whether it is arranged according to subjects such as later uh, the later Fichrist, who compiled uh, who compiled the catalog, etc., and perhaps above all, where to find it? Is this the Hedivo uh, Library one, Adam? I I don't understand the questions. Which catalog? I only have in the question 1872. I think this might be the um, uh, the the first um, okay. catalog oh, printed from the Hadiva Library. Which oh, yes, it's eighteen seventy three. I think the official. Uh, yeah. Thing yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's the Hadiva Library. Yeah, it, uh, it, I know that Leiden has a copy. Um, I believe that there are some uh, digitizations online. Actually, maybe the the British Library also makes that available online. It is organized. Um, uh, according to uh, you know subjects, but uh, from from the um, very much the the sort of uh, traditional Islamic view of uh, the Quran and sort of related texts first, and then and then the sort of hierarchy of um, disciplines uh, from there. It's um, a, a catalog that um, gets elaborated on in the um, 1880s um, through a much more detailed edition, um, which has very many more volumes um, first edited um, and, and composed by uh, Muhammad Hassanain. And so and so I, I think if one were trying to access this this text, maybe one of the best ways of doing it is to use the 1880s because you'll get more granular data on whether, for example, um, a text is uh, printed or not the, the year um, of its of its uh, production, for example, some of the, the figures who are involved um, in it, whereas the the 1872 1873 is really a rather sort of basic um, listing of a catalog. I just want to say that anybody who feels um, touched, uh, please join us because actually we also have a category whether some whether these titles are found in this particular catalog that you mentioned, so the Hadival um, Library catalog or other catalogs in Al Azhar University and Al Azhar. And, and, and other, so, so those of you who are interested, please contact us and we will be very happy to involve you. Thank you. A technical question from Roman Seidel. Is NoteGoat, in your opinion, also a useful tool for such kind of visualization you are aiming at? Or are there specific problems to be aware of with regards to such kind of ready-made tools? I'm sorry. Could you could you repeat the name of the um, uh, note goat? Note goat. Uh, no, we, I hadn't heard of it, but I will write that down and I will uh, look into <laughs> it because it, it sounds like a, a, a good lead. Um, a question. Um, Colinda Lindemann asks. I've been interested. I've been interested in how Palladio will be used. Uh, did you manage to uh, embed the app so people can filter everything according to what they're interested in? Yeah, uh, good question. So um, I I was playing with um, uh, Palladio for for the purposes of of this presentation, and I haven't been able to figure out how to embed um, the um, the networks. Um, the sort of blooming networks that one can create when you go to the site itself. And um, I fear that actually um, one is limited to uh, screenshots there. And so the, the next step for me will be to, to take um, these visualizations and, and to construct them in a far more laborious way on, on Tableau. Um, but that's it's certainly a, a limitation um, so far as I'm aware, and, and maybe uh, somebody uh, could correct me here, but for using that um, program, if you, if you were to use it in a classroom, for example, or as part of a, a presentation, you, you would have to uh, go in and, and put that data in first in order to, to move it around. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Karsten Valbina, who joined later because there was a power cut in Beirut. 
Are there any works by Christian Arab authors to be found in the collection? Yes, there are some. Yes, usually as far as I remember, but as I said, the list is there, so please feel free to check. Um, as far as I remember, there are um, especially um, um, education books um, uh, math in mathematics or, na or natural sciences, I, I think, um, from Beirut, written by or, or translated and written. Uh, also, I think there are some grammar books uh, in Arabic grammar books, of course. Okay, uh, one question from Del Korea. What challenges have you faced on the technical side with the bidirectionality of working between Arabic and English, at least, and font encoding? Um, if you have uh, had any issues, how have you approached potential solutions? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the, the, I didn't want to um, talk about this because it, it's, it's a little bit of a separate, a whole separate problem. Um, but um, um, there is an easy solution to the fact that these are um, right to left um, texts and, and, the, and the markup language is left to right, right? So um, the easy solution is that in, ox in the Oxygen software, you use the author mode and through a CSS code, uh, you, you, you can very easily define, so you just use the Oxygen as if it would be a browser. Um, um, so it's, it's very easy to define the Oxygen as, as um, the Oxygen surface as, as, as well. The, the, the more, and, and I myself and, and others who work with uh, TI XML Arabic text use this simple solution. The, there is an ongoing project um, by Hugh Kalens and, and perhaps others also in the TI organization to fully, to fully Arabize uh, XML, to, to make it possible that not only, uh, so, so, so that the elements and the attributes and everything is in the Arabic script. Um, or any kind of uh, uh, left to light, uh, sorry, right to left script. So, so, but that is an ongoing, and it's also possible. Uh, there is no reason why it shouldn't work. And actually we already tried and it works. And that makes it very easy. Okay. Um... It's hard to find a way to stop such an interesting conversation. And we want to thank Adam and Catherine for uh, giving us uh, this uh, in, an impressive presentation and from sharing some of your work. Um, it's really uh, very interesting and eye-opening. Um, we also want to thank all of you for joining us today. And we hope that you stay tuned for upcoming events in the areas of Near Eastern Intelligence and Digital Scholarship at the Institute over the course of what is left of this academic year. Um, and I hope that in the future, we can always uh, have Adam and Catherine back uh, to let us know how the progress of this project has gone and the improvements and the uh, solutions and findings. Um, the uh, any other events that we might have are also listed in the uh, appropriate NES or digital scholarship uh, websites. Uh, so for now, a uh, warm goodbye from Princeton, New Jersey, and I hope you will all join us again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.